This episode of the HEAC School Podcast is made possible by generous support from all of our sponsors, which include Carrier, makers of fine quality air conditioners, heat pumps, all kinds of different stuff. You know that. You know Carrier. Carrier, turn to the experts. Also, thank you to Rector Seal. Rector Seal sent me recently the new clear bodied safety switch model SS1. I'm sure you've seen the SS1 uh, switch, but it also comes with a, a really neat little adapter that you can use to actually blow out the T if you use it in line. I'm grabbing it right now. You can actually insert it into the T and use it to, uh, if you're, you can use it in the primary drain, you can actually use it as a clean out for the primary drain, uh, either like a normal clean out T, or you can use it and actually pressurize it with nitrogen and blow the drain out that way. It's a pretty cool device, and the clear body is actually really nice on it because you can see if there's any water in it, no matter what the configuration is. This episode is also made possible by one of our original sponsors, Testo. Big thank you to Testo for partnering with HVAC School, and thank you to Testo for being willing to work with the MeasureQuick app. We're really excited to see that relationship get started. Testo, perfect for testing perfect for service. This episode also is sponsored by Parker ZoomLock. Meet ZoomLock, the 10-second flame-free refrigerant fitting from Parker. Reduce labor costs by 60% with no brazing, no flame, and no fire spotter. Discover how ZoomLock can help you be more efficient and productive. Visit ZoomLock.com for more information. This is the man who had posters of Willis Carrier and John Gorey on his wall as a teenager, Brian Orr. Yes, that is true. Actually, it's not true. I've mentioned this before. I, I didn't have those posters, but I would have those posters now if I could find a John Gorey poster. I'm a big fan of John Gorey. For those of you who know the Thomas Edison Nikola Tesla battle, that's maybe kind of an obscure reference, but... John Gorey and Willis Carrier both have some claim to creating air conditioning, whereas John Gorey really did create ice machine. I mean, that's kind of what he really created is refrigeration. I, let's let's just let's just agree to disagree on this. Let's just agree that John Gorey invented compression refrigeration, and Willis Carrier invented the concept of dehumidification or humidity control. That, that's really what. That's really what Willis Carrier did more than anything else. But I'm not knocking the man. I'm a big Willis Carrier fan. Big fan of Willie. But I'm also a fan of John Gorey, and he's a Florida boy, so there's something to that. All right, today on the podcast, we've got the Jim Bergman. Jim Bergman is back, and Jim is talking more about evacuation. We've talked about evacuation once, but this time we kind of do it soup to nuts. Last one was more of a 101. On this one, we go from top to bottom, cover everything with evacuation. So if you want to know the official Jim Bergman stance on evacuation, everybody's talking evacuation right now, people. Big hoses, people. That's what everybody's talking about. But this episode, we kind of go through it soup to nuts, which I think is helpful if you kind of want to know the entire rig, what's what's recommended. We talk about breaking with nitrogen, some things that a lot of people have asked me. So that's what this podcast is about. Uh, if, if you get done with this podcast and you try some of these things and you want some feedback, you have some questions, you can always email me at brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at hvacrschool.com, hvacrschool.com. Or if you haven't been to the website, then I would suggest that you go to www. Actually, I don't say www. That's 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 old school. HVACRschool.com. HVACRschool.com. That's the website. Check it out. We got all kinds of resources there, including a lot of information on evacuation. So here we go. We got Jim Bergman talking about evacuation. All right. So today I want to talk about advanced um, evacuation. I've been saying um a lot lately. Um and actually. It's like, um, actually this, um, actually that. When I was recording a mid-roll, one of the tool tips for Testo the other day, I said actually like 17 times. And so I have a note now on my computer that says, stop saying actually. I'm supposed to be a professional at this. I thought I would be done with this by now. Um, actually, you're not. Yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the boat of confidence there, Jim. Actually, see, I did it again. I, I do have uh, preteen daughters now, so maybe I'm just getting to be more like them the more I go on. It 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 could be, or it just could be you're hanging around me and you're like a little fangirl running around screaming all the time. Oh, boy. I don't know what yeah. the... Yeah, that's true. So, so do you think that'll wear off anytime soon? Do you have any advice you can give me to maybe help that wear wear off? You know, as long as we keep talking about evacuation, I think it's just gonna it's gonna stay it's gonna stay up high up there. Yeah, that that is a pretty stimulating conversation. All right, so we're gonna do this quick because we got a lot of ground to cover. So, the most important thing, thing number one, the thing you talk about more than anything else, is that in order to pull a deep vacuum quickly, you need to use two large diameter hoses so half inch or three eighths something like that right 
Yeah, that's correct. Because when you're evacuating, the, the lowest pressure that you can achieve is negative 14.696, right? We're limited in physics on the depth of vacuum. It, it, it can't get any deeper than removing all the atmosphere, which is negative 14.696. So the only way to increase the speed is to increase the hose size. If we're going to increase the volume of, of gases we remove, we got to have a larger hose to do it because of the, of the limiting factor of pressure. So yes. All right, thing number two. So first, the first thing is having large diameter hoses, half inch or three eighths. Thing number two is using two core remover tools and removing your Schrader cores before you connect your hoses in the first place. Right, yeah, Schrader cores are, are a significant restriction. The hoses are actually maybe five times more important than the uh, just removing the Schrader cores. But the Schrader cores also provide a very significant restriction. You want to pull those out of there, and uh, that'll that'll dramatically speed things up. What just happened there? Are you yawning? I did. I did. As we get into this basic stuff, I I, I fell asleep again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So as an as another aside, when you are recovering refrigerant, when you're removing refrigerant from a system, it's also good to remove your Schraders during that situation as well, because the Schraders act as like almost like a metering device, which impedes the flow of the refrigerant when you're recovering. Yeah. It, in general, it's good to remove Schraders, and it's good to actually. Uh, if you're doing it as part of a service process, throw new ones in there, charge a customer for new Schrader valves and uh, put new ones in because they don't last forever either. Then put on some nice new brass caps with nice gaskets on there. You can That's a nice upsell or locking caps for those that live in neighborhoods where people huff refrigerant because it not only saves refrigerant, it saves lives. I mean, I live in the country and in the country, that's just that's just what we do for fun. Hey, your brother pees in bottles. I check. Yeah, that's I check true. your refrigerant levels at the office. Yeah, I'm trying to keep the bottle <laughs> peeing thing under wraps. I don't. I don't really want people to know about that. <laughs> it it changed me forever when I watched that video. I'm sorry. Oh boy. Yeah. I don't know. I I think I think it's my mother's fault. Something when she she had heat stroke when my brother was in the womb yeah, or something. Well, There's something wrong with that boy for sure. Okay, so after that. You want to make sure that you don't use a manifold when you're pulling the vacuum because the manifold is a restriction, but it's also a potential leak point. Well, and the other thing it does, a manifold does, is it doubles the length of your hose, right? Because if you think about, you know, you got the yellow hose going to the red hose. So if you got a five foot hose, now you got 10 foot, a quarter inch hose. And when it comes to conductance speed, the length of the hose plays a big factor in there too. So you want hoses that are as large and as short as possible to provide the minimum amount of friction. So the manifold is a huge source of leaks because a lot of the packings are not engineered for vacuum. That is one thing, um, products like the uh, the I-Manifold, they actually are, that is a, a vacuum rated manifold. That's a very good manifold, but you have multiple connection ports of hoses and things like that. So if you can avoid using the manifold, it's gonna dramatically decrease your evacuation time. Even manifolds that are engineered for it, I'd wholeheartedly say, Please never do that. the The only reason that the the manifold was ever equipped with a uh, with a hose is because uh, of the marketing department. Because somebody said at one time, "Boy, if I could just not have to hook up all these hoses and do this faster, you know, by doing it this way, you know, I'd buy that manifold all day long." Well, the problem was is that uh, there was some disconnect between the guys in engineering that actually knew how to do an evacuation and the marketing department that just thought it was a good idea to make it, you know, because somebody requested it that didn't understand what they were asking for. And that happens a lot in our industry. I mean, there's a lot of products out there we see that are, you look at it and you go, what what in the heck were they thinking when they made this thing? And it just goes back to, as an industry, we've, we've forgotten sometimes the fundamentals. It happens. It happens in every industry. And we're just, we're a victim of that too. If I let you go for more than about 30 seconds, you just start preaching. I do. You just hop up on that pulpit and you just start pounding. Brian, it. I've never been off the pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep wanting to say amen and raise my hands from the back of the pews. It's Try um or actually then. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I totally want to raise my hands and like say amen. Man, you just pick on me. You just beat me up. So you pointed out the short, large diameter hoses and I bought a bunch of three foot, half inch hoses and in my opinion, those are a little bit too short. That was kind of a mistake. That's not a mistake. Uh, it's just I too short if, if you can't get them hooked up. I right. mean, it, I mean, they were really challenging. So I gave them to a bunch of different technicians, and they're just a little too short in general to connect. So I guess in cases where it is still a possibility, then it's a good thing to have them nice and short like that. But they're a little 
tricky in some cases, and in some cases just trying to make the 90 to get it around with how stiff a half-inch hose is, I'm not going to suggest getting three-foot hoses. I would suggest, in most cases, get two large-diameter uh, six-foot hoses. Well, the only reason they're standard is because that's the length they make them. Um, and, and that's no joke. I mean, that's, they come, you know, Appian's probably the number one seller of, uh, of vacuum rated hoses in our industry. And they just happen to sell most of them as are six footers by default. Um, they can custom make you a hose any, any length you want. And, uh, so a lot of guys will order customized links, but for the most part, um, that's why we see so many six foot hoses is simply because, that's the way they make them. Well, they do make three foot hoses and they do make them and we tried them and I wouldn't necessarily recommend them. Although I will say if you do want a fast vacuum, we did use them the other day, two of them with a small five CFM Robin air pump and it, it did a great job. So I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying don't do it, but I wouldn't recommend it because they are a little tough to deal with. Yeah. And that's, that's what people don't realize is um, you're probably getting a true five CF, a fi- true five CFM out of that pump. You take that 5 CFM pump and you put quarter-inch hoses on it, leave the Schraders in there, you're lucky if you're getting 0.7 CFM, no matter how big the pump is. You could put a a 3 CFM pump, a 5 CFM pump, a 15 CFM pump on that system, and the most you're going to get out of it is 0.7 CFM with that rig attached to it because the rig is the limiting factor because no matter how big the pump is, it can't pull a deeper vacuum than negative 14.7 or 14.696, they're all limited by physics. So the rig, the vacuum rig, what we attach to the pump is almost more important than the pump size itself. All right. The next thing that you practice and I practice in our business is we use Nylog. And this isn't a need to thing, but Nylog does help as an assembly lubricant when you connect things together and you connect all your rigs together. And it also just helps make sure everything is tight and well sealed. But I've seen a lot of guys overdo it recently where they're putting like a half a bottle on stuff when really it just needs to be a small amount. I use Nylog, but use it extremely sparingly. Like uh, we're talking quarter of a drop of Nylog on something. Nylog is actually a, an assembly lubricant. So what it does is it keeps things from uh, from galling or binding as you hook them up together. It's it's just an oil. It's it's really not a sealant. I don't think it ever dries per se. They may advertise it as a sealant, but it's really it's a it's a high quality assembly lubricant, and it makes sure when the gaskets seat that they're not binding up or anything, and they're not uh, nothing's getting cut. The, the the challenge with nylog, if you're going to use nylog on things, I cannot stress enough: put plugs in your hoses and put caps on your stuff after you're done because nylog. Because it's an oil, it also attracts dirt and grime and things like that. And there's, I don't know of anything actually that that uh, is a solvent for Nylog. So the only thing you can do is wipe it off. If you don't put plugs in your hoses and you're not putting caps on your uh, on your male uh, connections, they're going to attract dirt, and then then you got to you know then you got other problems you got to deal with. You got to clean all that off off there, and uh, you know then then re- reapply it. But Nylog's good, but very 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 sparingly especially keep it out of your vacuum gauge because uh, once you get Nylog on the on the uh, thermistor, there's virtually no way of getting it off. Yeah, I've experienced that same thing. I've seen guys just use way too much and it gets all dirty and everything. But one thing that I do agree with you about, just about putting caps on everything and keeping everything sealed up, but I have never done that with my hoses. I mean, I put them on the stops on the back of my manifold, but with vacuum hoses, I've just never done this. But one thing that I think would be a good idea, and I've experimented with this, is actually connecting the two hoses together with just a male-to-male fitting. Yep, that's that's perfect too. You ever taken a, a hose out of the truck, like out of the bag, and you smell the rubber smell of the hose? You know, you can smell it. it smells like rubber. It smells like you know black rubber or whatever. Or pencils. You open up a bag of pencils and you smell the smell of the pencils or whatever. Everything has sort of a smell to it. Well, that's the smell is outgassing. And outgassing, we're talking a refrigerant hose uh, or an evacuation hose. The hose has to outgas for several hours before you can achieve its ultimate vacuum level. When you smell rubber on the hose, what you're smelling is gases coming out of that hose. And until you evacuate it long enough that the rubber is fully cured, the hose cannot achieve its ultimate vacuum level. Now, that said... When you dry out a hose, when you pull a deep, deep vacuum and that hose becomes dry, that rubber becomes very dry, well, then that rubber also becomes hydroscopic because now when you open that hose up the atmosphere, 
it's immediately going to pull all that moisture you you just try to remove back into the hose till it gets to an equal vapor pressure an equal you know an equilibrium with the with the moisture that's in the air and if you have any poe oil in there a film of oil in there then there's a chemical attraction with a with a poe is going to bond to the water and, and that hose will become uh, almost useless because it's very very hard to remove poe oil from uh from a uh, or water from poe so it just becomes you know this molecular bond and it's very very hard to break so keeping that hose free of oil a dedicated vacuum hoses number one dedicated vacuum hoses don't don't use the same hose you use for charging for evacuation with poe oil that's a that's a huge problem today the 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 hoses if you have hoses evacuation hoses always on the parks always tight on the parks don't disconnect the hose from the manifold and leave them off there because they will pull in moisture and you're going to introduce that moisture back into the system separate hoses for evacuation close the hoses off after you're done evacuating to keep them from pulling in moisture from the atmosphere and if you keep that hose clean, dry, and tight, it's going to last much longer and it will also significantly decrease your evacuation times. Because once you get that sucker dried out, it's never it, you don't have to go through that drying process again each time you use it. I believe Appian is part of their uh, hose testing. They still degas all their hoses before they send them. And they put them on a uh, on a rig. They run them, they pull them in a vacuum as part of the testing process. They do a long-term pull down on the hose and it does a degassing of the hose. They bag it up. So it's not like uh, uh, they do put some plastic caps on there. They're not sealed, but they do go through an initial degassing or initial curing of that rubber. And then all you're removing out of them at that point when you get them in the field is the moisture. I always tell guys, one thing that when you're looking at your hoses, connect your, your gauge directly to your vacuum pump with a little brass coupler, just connect it directly to the vacuum pump, pull vacuum. It'll pull down to like a good pump will pull down below 10 microns and, and some will pull down two or three microns. Uh, 50 microns is the minimum I like to see in a pump. Some people say a hundred. I don't like to see a pump pulling less than 50, but you'll pull down somewhere below 10 microns on a good, on a good pump. Most JB pumps, yellow jacket pumps, Hillmore pumps are all rated in that range. Now disconnect the vacuum gauge, attach your hose to it and attach your vacuum gauge to the end of your hose and pull that vacuum again. And what you're going to see is the impact of the of that hose on the system. You're not going to be able to pull down as deep because the hose is degassing and the hose is also gas permeable. Uh, any hose that's flexible, you know, a copper line is less gas permeable than rubber hoses, let's say, by a long shot. But even copper line is, is uh, gas permeable. It will not, in a molecular level, even copper leaks. For the most part, it's so tiny of a leak rate, it, it's insignificant for our industry. It would last 100 years, let's say. But it, it is going to leak out over time. But that rubber hose is even more gas permeable. And you'll see that in your micron gauge, especially if you're using a really good vacuum gauge uh, that's got high resolution like the, the blue vac gauge. It'll, it'll show you that pretty quickly. Then you get to understand a little bit more about how important keeping those dry are. And if you let that run and run and run on that just that vacuum hose, as that hose degasses, it'll pull down faster the next time and faster the next time again uh, until it reaches its ultimate pull down rate. And then all you're looking at is the gas permeability of the hose. And then you take the hose out in the middle of a thunderstorm and you expose it to rain and weather. And then you're just right back to square one again. Well, only if you have the hose open to the atmosphere. If if you uh, if you don't have the hose open to the atmosphere, the rain's on the outside, the hose is dry on the inside. Yeah, I was I was joking anyway. So. Well, I don't care. I'm not going to let you be sarcastic during our evacuation topics. This is serious stuff. I know this is serious stuff. I mean, this is like this is vacuum. This is evacuation. Sorry, I should have known better. All right, back to serious stuff here. Actually, um, all right, so what I would recommend is get a coupling that's quarter inch, male flare to three eighths, male flare, something like that, and just kind of connect your hoses in a loop so that way they're connected end to an end, something like that. You can do it that way, or you can just buy a, a three eighths by quarter coupling and just hook your hoses end to end and uh, storm in a truck, hang them on a hook or something just so they're in a circle. But the three eighths by quarter coupling will work just fine throw it in your tool bag when you're not using it and then you know you're good to go if you don't want to leave everything if you don't want to leave it attached to your vacuum tree oh okay i see i see what you're saying all right so just leave everything connected all yeah to your either way just keep the just keep them plug, just keep them so they're not exposed to atmosphere that's all. all right the point is is that your vacuum hoses you want to keep them sealed up you want to keep them from getting atmosphere and moisture inside the hoses 
And I agree with that. It's just something that I don't think that most technicians are practicing. So I guess it's an area for improvement. But All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is vacuum pump oil. Are you one of these who says that you need to change vacuum pump oil after every single evacuation? Is that what you practice? The answer is it depends. And uh, no, not after every single vacuum. But if every single vacuum I did was on a dirty, contaminated system, then yes. If every single vacuum I did was on a clean, new installation, then no, right? It uh, vac- Vacuum pump oil, it, it, removes, it removes contaminants, you know, that get pulled into the vacuum. It remo- and contaminants meaning more gas contaminants, things that outgas in the oil than solids. Vacuum pumps don't pull solids back to the pump. You might get a little bit when it first starts because there's some what's called viscous flow where you might pull back some oxides or things like that. But for the most part, vacuum pumps don't pull solids. It's like dropping a BB in the bottom of a Coke bottle and trying to suck it out from the top, right? No matter how hard you suck on that Coke bottle, there's no flow through it. You just drop the pressure. There's no flow. It's the same thing happens in a vacuum pump. Now, they'll remove some contaminants that get uh, entrained in the viscous flow, and then they're pulling out moisture. Uh, is the big thing the vacuum pump oil, oil removes. There is a gas ballast, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute, but the gas ballast helps remove some of the, the moisture from the vacuum pump oil. And depending on the type of oil that you're using, uh, sometimes uh, oils are either hydroscopic or hydrophobic is two terms you might hear, which one readily absorbs moisture and one readily rejects moisture. But sometimes you get different oils that will will pull that moisture in and there's no way to get it out of there. And, and other times it can be uh, easily released from the oil as it comes out. There's no one size fits all for that answer. Should you change it regularly? Yeah, I would say uh, if you're not billing the customer for the vacuum pump oil and changing it each time, then what are you, what are you doing? It's something you, you can do anyway. I, if, if I have somebody paying for the oil, I'm going to keep my pump oil as clean as possible and change it after every use. Maybe at most I might go three times for typical system evacuations, but I've got oil in the vacuum pumps at the office because I'm always evacuating clean tanks and things like that, that I'd let that oil go for a year before I change it. And that's not just me. I mean, I can show you, um, there's books on vacuum science, Welsh vacuum pump. I'll tell you exactly the same thing, you know, uh, six months to a year on on vacuum pump oil that's used in uh, clean applications. All right. So let's say somebody says, okay, ultimately the vacuum pump, the point is if you can pull the vacuum down to where you're supposed to, you can blank it off and test it and you pull down to 30 microns quickly. Is that an indication that the vacuum is working fine regardless of the vacuum pump oil, as long as you're not seeing any sludge or the oil doesn't look creamy or anything like that? Yes and no. Uh, I, I would always recommend that you pull a bit of oil from the bottom of your sump or your vacuum pump. If you're going to check, if you're going to check your oil, put it in a clear container or white container. Well, not white because you can't see if it's milky or not. But put it in, in a clear container. Pull a, full, a small sample out of the bottom of the pump to see if the if the pump's uh, oil is wet and dirty, because oil floats on top of water, right? So if you have moisture, it'll end up in the bottom of your pump and it ends up as a sludge. And uh, when when you when you start the pump up, it becomes emulsified or it attaches to the oil. But over time, the the two will separate. You get the water in the bottom, you get the sludge in the bottom. So trying to tell if the oil is dirty or not through the sight glass is um, is not a real good way of doing it. Now, in the way uh, Appian does it, and I sound like an Appian salesman today, but good for you, Appian. You got something <laughs> out of me for free. Appian actually circulates their oil through their through their oil container, so you can see there's basically no oil left in the pump when you shut the pump off. All the oil is back into the container, so you can look at the at the Appian pump oil and see whether or not it's clean or dirty. That's a pretty cool feature of that pump, where a regular pump, you know, you just can't see it unless you unless you pull a bottom sample on there. Okay, so I guess the key thing here is don't discount the value of changing pump oil for the lubrication purposes of it and for it not having those contaminants in it. So it's actually the longevity and the operation of the pump itself, not just the hygroscopic properties of the oil, I guess. Is that a good way of saying that? A couple other things. When you when you store your pump, cap your pump, there's, a, there's usually a little red plug, a rubber plug that you put into the back of your pump that uh, you plug the vent with. It's just a, a friction fit plug. Some of you guys will notice that there's a little a cap that you can unscrew on the handle. Don't ever put a cap on that cap. 
Okay, because if you forget to take it off, you'll blow your vacuum pump up. Because there's no there's no pressure relief on a vacuum pump exhaust, and it will literally blow the housing in two if you put a if you put a cap on that. But if if you don't keep your pump capped, Richie sends a little friction fit caps for the vent, and a JB puts a little rubber plug in the handle. And if you don't cap that vacuum pump oil off, also it's pulling in moisture. It'll make the pump take a longer time to evacuate. And this goes back to you know one of the things I almost religiously do every time I use a vacuum pump is I disconnect my vacuum rig, cap off the vacuum ports, put my vacuum gauge on just the pump and and check the ultimate pull down level of the pump to make sure it goes down. You know, in my case, I like to see below 10 microns. Below 25 is more than good for, for most of the things that we do. That some people tell you as high as 100, but uh, at 100 microns, that pump's just not pulling well enough. Test the vacuum pump first and see how good the oil is. Make sure the pump's pulling. And then after you make sure the pump's pulling, then you can determine if you need to change the oil or not pretty quickly. Because if you have dirty vacuum pump oil, your pump won't pull down. So there's no reason to let that vacuum pump run for 45 minutes before you realize you're not making good progress in your evacuation. Test the pump first. It's a lot cheaper and a lot faster. One other piece of advice, don't pour vacuum pump oil down rooftop drains or pour it on rooftops. Rubber roofs, vacuum pumps will eat the rubber roof, and your boss will pay a whole boatload of money to get the rubber roof fixed. And if you pour it down the drain, you're pouring it in our sanitary systems, and you're pouring it in our drinking water because everything we flush gets recycled, and we get to drink it a couple months later. So don't do that either. It's it's bad for the environment, bad for the roof. Take it to an oil recycling or take it back to your office if they have oil tanks and dump it in there. Don't take a shortcut. Don't keep the oil in your truck in gallons where it gets tipped over and eventually gets all over the floor either. That's not good either. That just drives me crazy. Make sure you're managing that well because um, it is mineral oil. It's just like dumping uh, automotive oil on the ground. It's, it's not a good thing for the for anybody. Yeah, quick tip here. Most auto parts stores will accept used vacuum pump oil and they're not going to complain about you, you know, bringing that in. They're not going to care that it's mineral oil or if it's motor oil. Yeah. Testo is celebrating 60 years of high quality instrumentation with their best in class fall combustion analyzer promotion. There's never been a better time to get a high quality Testo combustion analyzer than right now. This offer is for a free 770-3 meter, the meter we've talked about a lot on this podcast with Bluetooth and direct power reading and inrush amps and many more uh, great features. You can get that meter for free if you purchase the Testo 320 or 330 series of combustion analyzers, or you can get a 745 non-contact voltage sensor if you purchase the Testo 310. This is a limited time offer, and you can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com forward slash fall promo, which will take you to the Testo site where you can get the form to fill out. You do need to hold on to your receipt from whoever you purchased the combustion analyzer from. But of course, we suggest if you don't have a a local supply house that stocks these, you can easily go to truetechtools.com, T-R-U techtools.com and use the offer code get schooled and you'll get an additional 8% off. Then just save your receipt that you get from True Tech Tools. Go to hvacrschool.com forward slash fall promo and fill out the form and you will get either a free 770-3 meter or a 745 non-contact voltage sensor from Testo. Testo, 60 years of excellence. Perfect for testing. Perfect for service. The next thing is going to be the location of the micron gauge. So we want the micron gauge to be connected to the side of one of the valve core tools so that it can be valved off. You do not want the uh, micron gauge, uh, vacuum gauge connected at the vacuum tree, at the vacuum pump. You want it as close to the system as possible so that it can be isolated away from the pump and so that you're not, you know, having leaks that are associated with your manifold or with your pump or anything else. After you test your vacuum pump, take the gauge off the pump. Honestly, if you want to leave a gauge on your vacuum pump, then, then buy a blue vac micro or buy an inexpensive vacuum gauge connected to your pump. But that is absolutely the worst place to do it to, to monitor the system evacuation. We said earlier in the podcast, test your hoses. You get to see how much your hoses leak and how much it affects when you connect 
your hose to the system, how much it affects the ultimate vacuum level. You're going to see you're going to lose maybe 10 to 100 microns just through your hoses and, and pumping capability. Don't be surprised because that's what's going to happen. When we're connected right at the vacuum pump, the vacuum is deeper at the pump than it is at the system itself. Think of a return in a room, like a return grill, right? A return grill pulls from a local local area. You can't really pull air across the room from a return effectively, yet we can blow it across with a supply register. So the vacuum is strongest at the pump inlet. And the further away we get from the pump, the weaker the vacuum gets. So the vacuum at the pump is not reflective of the vacuum at the system. If you got to the furthest point in the system, the vacuum would be at its weakest. And when we isolate it with the core tools and we allow that vacuum to equalize, then we can see what the true level of vacuum is on the system. That's what those core tools are designed to do, is to isolate the pump from the system. And also the core tools are not gas permeable or very minimal amount of permeability through the gaskets and things. For our purposes, they don't leak like uh, a hose leaks. So it allows us to get an, a very accurate reflection of what the vacuum is in the system when we isolate them with the core tools. And uh, on, the, on the core tools, the ideal place, I will say we have seen over and over and over again on core tools that the Schrader does not fully open when you attach your brass non-permeable coupling for your vacuum gauge on there. So if you're using a vacuum gauge that can handle higher pressures, just pull that Schrader core out altogether because it, it eliminates some nuisance problems. Be aware of that. When you see a vacuum gauge like fluctuating, like goes up 100 microns, back down 100 microns, up 100 microns, down 100 microns, up 100 microns, down 100 microns, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And you're going, what the heck's going on? It's not stuff boiling off out of your oil. Your Schrader core is not open all the way. And there's a thin film of oil around the uh, Schrader core that is the oil is breaking open because of the viscosity of the oil, oil sticky. And uh, every time the oil bubbles through, you see your vacuum change a little bit. It's just bubbling through the oil. And uh, that's what's causing your gauge to fluctuate so rapidly. Just to be clear, we're talking about the Schrader on the side of the valve core tool here because we're removing the Schraders that are actually in the system. The ones that are in the actual service valves, those are taken out. But the one in the side port, that's in there. And when you attach the coupler that you attach your micron gauge to, it may not be depressing fully. Exactly. Some some guys will use a, a third core removal tool and they'll just attach it to that side port and then they can valve off their vacuum gauge when they go to charge the system up so they don't damage the gauge. That's really important. Like if you're using an old thermal thermal engineering vacuum gauge, because those are rated at about 50 pounds of pressure. A lot of vacuum equipment's not rated for pressure at all. Some things will take a hundred pounds. The blue vac, I actually hydrostatic tested that sensor and it failed at over 4,200 pounds of pressure. So it'll, it'll take 500 PSI pretty easily. Some vacuum gauges can handle pressure, some cannot. So you just have to look at your vacuum gauge, determine what you have. And you can either, like I said, use a third core tool to isolate it if it, if it can't handle any pressure at all. And it's not a bad thing to do anyway. I mean, I even do it, would do it on my blue vacs, but some guys don't want to spend an extra 40 bucks for an extra core tool. And, you know, that's, that's their choice. Yep. That, that's a good thing to do. Well, and I'm sure it actually depends on the actual setup that you're using. In some cases, that little coupler might have a more aggressive depressor that might work fine. And it, it really just depends on the exact configuration. You could even make a homemade piece with a Schrader on the end. There's a lot of different configurations you can create for that type of coupler. We're going to build an algorithm for that in the BlueVac uh, professional gauge that'll detect that exact problem. Because I've seen it happen so many times, we decided we just put an algorithm in when we get a few minutes to breathe, when we get off the measure quick topic and uh, get on to some other things again. But it is a problem you do run across. All right, so we got vacuum pumps, oil, we got Schrader's out of the way. What's your next question? In the last episode, we didn't talk about decay, and decay is one of those topics that you've talked a lot about, and we didn't really we didn't cut, touch on it much in the last podcast. So we know that the decay varies depending on the type of system, whether it's low temp or whatever it is. So we know that, but with the Blue Bat Vac Professional, you can actually set a decay target. And so for a typical residential light commercial application, something like that, with the Blue Vac Pro, where you can track it with your app and measure quick. What do you think the average air conditioning decay rate, what should you set that up for when you're setting up that that app with BlueVac? Oh, okay. I was going to say you can prevent decay with fluoride toothpaste, but... Oh, yeah, really? All right. Well, um, yeah, my family's from West Virginia, so we give up on our teeth at like the age of 10, something like that. You know that the, that the toothbrush was invented by a West Virginian. 
<laughs> yeah, because otherwise it'd be called the teeth brush. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, okay. I, I get it. I get it. So oh, I'm sorry, West Virginia. Hurts <laughs> my feelings, man. Uh, but I'm picking on Brian, not all of West Virginia. So Yeah. All right. Beautiful country up there. It is. Not a lot of teeth to go around, but a lot of cousins to marry. Better roads than Ohio by a long shot. So <laughs> <laughs> That's not hard. All right. So so back to decay. Ultimately, the depth of vacuum that we try and achieve is based upon the the application. If the moisture is could freeze in the application. So the when we get into like cascade systems where we're going to negative 40, negative 80, negative 100, we have to have a much lower level of evacuation than we do in an air conditioning system because the dew point of the moisture in there, it, it's going to start to freeze out and cause other problems in the system. So uh, ultimately, that's what drives that. It's how dry do we need that system so we don't have issues with ice. Now, all that all that said, on, on an air conditioning system, if you look at carrier's installation manuals, even for 410A, carrier will tell you that the maximum allowable decay is 1,000 microns. So you pull down, you hold uh, below 500 microns, for some period of time, typically hold below 500 microns for 10 minutes. You're going to isolate your core tools and you're going to make sure that it holds below 1,000 microns. That's the allowable. In practice, our industry does not want to see us go above 500 microns because we know that what's acceptable and what's good practice. Just like combustion analyzers, the maximum allowable CO is 400 ppm, but we like to see it below 100 ppm because we know that's totally achievable. We know that vacuum levels below 500 microns are totally achievable if you're using a good rig. So typically what I'll have guys do is pull down to 250 microns or below, isolate the system off, and then watch the decay and make sure that it doesn't rise over 500 parts per million in a, in a 10 minute period. The blue vac gauge again, it'll, it'll, you just said 500 parts per oh, million, 500, sorry, 500 microns. Thank you. I was just combustion. I, I talked about combustion. I went right to PPM. Uh, you were just seeing if I was paying attention. Yeah. What you're doing yeah. There. So, um, well, actually moisture in a vacuum is measured in parts per million. So if we we're measuring a moisture in a vacuum, we could do it that way, but that's a sidebar. Because what we're looking at is moisture level. It's really cool. If you ever get a chance, take a tank and evacuate it down and isolate it and let it set. And you're going to see this. It'll go up, it'll curve, and it'll tail off. It'll have a, a pretty steep curve and tail off. You know, it'll rise quickly, almost go straight up, then it'll curve and then tail off on the on the vacuum. If you're using like a, a, a gauge where you can graph the vacuum. Take that same tank, evacuate it down, isolate it, and let it set overnight. Evacuate it again the next day. Look at the characteristic of the curve again. And the curve, when you isolate it off, it will almost go dead flat when you isolate off the vacuum pump. And that's because over time, the moisture that's molecularly bonded to the steel will disattach from the tank. It'll get into the into the vapor of the tank. And when you turn the vacuum pump on again, you're pulling that moisture out. And you're not seeing the effect of the decay due to moisture bonded to the walls. So just because we can pull a vacuum like super fast with a big hoses doesn't mean that we should not give it time to adequately dehydrate. Now, this is really only important if your piping is open to atmosphere and, you know, we're not running nitrogen through it. We're not keeping the tubing dry because most tubing that we buy today, it should be what's called refrigerant rated tubing, and it should come with rubber plugs in it. it should You should get a hiss of nitrogen out when you open it up. It's dehydrated from the factory. Then you, you know, when you install that tubing, you're running nitrogen through it. When you're doing your brazing, all that kind of stuff. Well, it's never going to get any any moisture on the walls of the tubing, and you're going to get a very quick degassing and dehydration. The coils treated the same way. When you open up an evaporator coil, you get the hiss of nitrogen on there. It's because it's been pre-evacuated from the factory and then pressurized with nitrogen, and it's it's clean, dry, and tight. So uh, again. When you isolate your pump off, you're not going to have this rapid rise and decay curve due to the moisture. But typically, you know, I'll set the targets personally, me, 250 and 500, a lobble's 500 and 1,000. You know, for some guys, if they're using quarter inch hoses to hit 500 microns, might take them, uh, you know, might take them an hour and a half, two hours to do, where you and I, with the hoses we're using, we could pull that same system down in a minute and have it down below 500 and probably below 250 in maybe a minute and a half to two minutes on a on a two or three ton system. Using the right equipment definitely has some huge advantages to doing what we're prescribing here. Interestingly enough, 
You have to be very careful when you're trying to determine the difference between decay and a leak in a in a vacuum. We found this out when I was building the app for the uh, for the blue vac gauge, and um, all vacuum gauges use a logarithmic type uh, scale, which means you you have a, a million points of data, right? There's 760,000 microns in atmospheric, so the, a vacuum gauge starts at let's say a million microns, and then you're pulling all the way down to you know, 50, 100 microns. So think about this huge scale. Well, it's broken up into chunks. So it might be 750,000 down to 50,000 and 50,000 down to 25,000 and then 25,000 down to 2,000 and 2,000 down to 1,000 and, you know, from 1,000 down to 500 and 500 down to 50 and, you know, then 50 to one. So you got all these different scales and they aren't linear if you were to take in and uh, look at it on a logarithmic gr graph it would actually it's going to give you a, like some kind of a funky curve on there because uh, you're taking a whole bunch of different um, scales and condensing them and, and it makes the vacuum look funny so uh, when you isolate it off it's very hard to tell the difference between a, a leak and decay and i actually um i don't know if you remember or not but i actually wrote you an article for HVAC school, which you put your name on, that put my name at the bottom when we were first trying to figure this out. Not that you would steal anything from me, Brian. Uh, it, it is on there. And actually, we got some pictures of that. So what we ended up doing in the in the BlueVac app was we actually made it log. Uh, we took the logarithmic graph, and when you do the decay test, it it makes it into a, a linear format, so you can see the difference between the two. It's a really good article. If you got a few minutes, go to HVAC school and uh, look up vacuum decay. Maybe, I don't know. You maybe you can look it up and tell everybody at some point, but that was a, an epiphany for me. I just never realized how much information was hidden in the logarithmic graph. So Jim's exactly right. You can go to HVACRschool.com and just search vacuum and you'll find Jim's article. And I'm absolutely sure you will find Jim a proper, properly attributed in that article. So just search vacuum in there. At the top of the article, you will find Jim Bergman's name, I'm certain. If it isn't, then it will be by the time this goes live, because I can't be wrong about this sort of thing. But the one thing I want to add here is that you're not going to, under a typical circumstance, pull the system to 250, 300, 250, have the system hold a vacuum of under 500 for 10 minutes and have a system that has a significant moisture issue or a leak in the system. That's just not going to happen under practical conditions. And so it's a good final test to do to ensure that you don't have leaks in the system and to ensure that the system's dry and tight. So practically, you're, you're correct. From a practical standpoint, you're correct. In, in reality, you always have leaks. It's the rate of leakage that we're concerned with. When you have mechanical fittings of any type, you can never, with 100% certainty, get that system to where it is tight and will never leak. It's just what we're doing is reducing the leak rate when we have really good assemblies. We're taking it to such a low leak, leak rate that it doesn't matter. So you are technically correct. When we valve it off, the leak rate is so low at that point when, when it's down to 250 and we're letting it rise to 500. If it doesn't go above 500 in 10 minutes, the leak rate is so low that it's insignificant. It's just technically it is leaking. And if you let it set for two or three days or two or three weeks, you would see that your vacuum rose up over a thousand or two thousand microns at some point. You know, whatever it is, it's going to continue to decay, but it's just what we're looking at is leak rate. Don't ever think that you can get a system so tight that it, you're not going to have a leak. The only thing I could do that with is like a, a bulb, a glass, a glass bulb. You might be able to get tight enough that you couldn't ever detect the leak rate on it because you know, when they heat the glass up and seal it off, the vacuum's pretty well locked in there and glass is not a gas permeable substance like rubber is or copper is or the mechanical fittings that we have, all the packings and things that we have on valves and, and things like that, mechanical flares, they all leak a small amount. Now, if you're using a, a good flare tool like that, the rigid spin flare, um, and you're getting a really nice burnished face, it's going to leak less than if you're using, uh, you know, some of the old style flare tools we use that use the, where they didn't deburr well and you had a, a lousy flare fitting. The quality of your flare is going to also dictate that, but all of them do leak at some small rate. By rigid spin flare, he means the Rector Seal ProFit flaring tool. That's what I meant. Rector yeah, seal. absolutely. ProFit That's, that's what seal. I meant. Yeah, I was thinking, I don't know why I was thinking rec, uh, rigid instead of Rector Seal. And I actually... Uh, I actually was just reading about that a couple of weeks ago. So my, 
my brain skipped a gear, but at least you know what the heck we're talking about. All right. So the next question is about braking with nitrogen. A lot of guys talk about a triple evac, but it's doing nitrogen sweeps at different stages in the vacuum. So under what circumstances do you advise that? Do you think it's a good idea? Some guys will say you absolutely have to do it. What are you, what are your, what is your stance on braking with nitrogen, sweeping nitrogen through the system? The only reason you want to do a triple evac today, you can do it if you have moisture in the system. A triple evac may help with moving out some moisture because, again, moisture will not bond to nitrogen. The nitrogen will not pick up the moisture, absorb it like a sponge, and you expel it out. It just doesn't It doesn't happen that way. It's not uh, like a hydroscopic sponge that goes through there. What we do is called a nitrogen sweep. So, actually, one thing that we didn't talk about real quick, and before I say because it deals with nitrogen, I want to just sidebar this in there. When, whenever you put nitrogen in a system, the very first thing you want to do is you want to inter- inject the nitrogen into the, let's say, the suction side of the system or the liquid side of the system, whatever suits your fancy. Probably put it in the, in the liquid side of the system so you're pushing it through the, with a, through the metering device and back out the other direction, out, out the suction line. You always want to purge it all the way through, and you want to push the nitrogen, let's say, from the liquid line through the metering device, and then vent it out the suction line. So uh, when you break the vacuum, take it just up to where it's a pound or two of pressure, then open up the uh, core tool and push the nitrogen through the system and let it come out the other side. Now, there's a, a very good reason to to do that. Number one is called entrainment. So the moisture will be entrained with the nitrogen and it'll push that moisture out of the system. Now, here's why you don't want to get done brazing and then pressurize the system without doing a purge through. And the reason is, is just like if, if any of you guys have ever used an air compressor, when you compress air and increase its density or compress nitrogen and increase the density, what's the moisture do in the air, Brian? Answer is it condenses, Jim. It condenses to a liquid. And typically in an air compressor, that's why we drain the air compressor out. We drain the moisture that's condensed in the bottom of an air compressor. Well, if we get moisture in a line and we can increase the pressure and we condense it and the moisture drops out wherever in a, in the suction line and the compressor and the whatever when that moisture drops out as a liquid you cannot pull it out of the system except through evaporation a vacuum gauge cannot suck the drop of water down the liquid line and out it's going it, it can only reduce the pressure and as the pressure is reduced, hopefully that moisture boils away and is carried away. But if it's in a cooler part of the system, like if we're talking refrigeration, where you might have a two evaporators and the, the box is still at, let's say, 40 degrees or zero degrees, when that moisture condenses out in, in the evaporator, it's going to just freeze to a little brick of ice. And then it's going to have to be removed through sublimation, which is going to take forever. You always want a nitrogen sweep and purge it through, and then you'll be good. Now, Here's the other thing. The nitrogen is the gas that your vacuum gauge is calibrated for. Anybody that's using a thermistor style vacuum gauge, which would be JB, Testo, Robinair, Thermal, BlueVac, pick any manufacturer you want. They use thermistor vacuum gauges. There's nobody that's using an absolute pressure sensor of any kind for measuring vacuums at the levels we do because they're just not accurate enough. There's some, like Testo, I believe, uses a Pirani sensor. The thermistor gauge that's used in uh, the BlueVac is a very, very microscopic size thermistor. It's about the size of a hot wire. I mean, it's really, really, really tiny. And then you get other ones that are like the the thermal engineering. They use a, a really thick, heavy, robust thermistor. Um, but there's different, you know, you'll see different size thermistors, different applications, but they're all calibrated for the same thing, which is nitrogen or air. Okay. So here's a little science experiment I'd like you to do next time you, uh, you get a second. Take a, a tank of 410A R22 and just probably 410A because R22 is so expensive. Put a small amount of refrigerant vapor in your sensor, just, you know, like you're purging a hose. Next time you purge a hose, so it can be a de minimis release. Purge that refrigerant gas into into your vacuum gauge sensor, just the the, the vapor itself, and you're going to see your vacuum gauge is going to drop down to 300, 600 microns. Why the heck is that? Well, vacuum gauges are are thermistors, and they're a heat transfer gauge. So you got one that's a heated thermistor, and they're both heated thermistors. One's in the atmosphere, and one's in the vacuum, and you're just you're checking the rate of heat transfer between them, and and just seeing and that's how they're checking the uh, depth of vacuum because heat will not 
transfer in a vacuum as readily as it will in the air because there's no air to transfer the heat away from the thermistor. It's just a Wheatstone bridge type circuit in there. And they're just looking at the difference between the two and then they calibrate it to microns. Well, yeah, a Wheatstone bridge circuit, obviously. Yep. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay. So when you, when you spray the sensor with a small amount of refrigerant, the refrigerant has a different thermal conductivity than the air does. And it will fool the sensor into thinking that it's in a vacuum when it's not. And so one of the things that you'll notice, sometimes you'll get a vacuum that stalls. And what's what's happening is you're probably still pulling a deep vacuum, but the atmosphere is contaminated and it's, and it's influencing your vacuum gauge. So a nitrogen sweep, if you purge through and push out any residual refrigerant gases in there, sometimes what will happen is your vacuum will drop like immediately. You'll go, wow, that, that nitrogen sweep really, really helped. Well, it really... It didn't help with anything but the accuracy of your gauge. The system was already degassed and dehydrated. You just couldn't you couldn't measure the effectiveness of the vacuum because it was in a contaminated atmosphere. And when you purged it with nitrogen and pushed out the residual gases, you recalibrated the gas to the atmosphere it was calibrated for, and now it's reading correct vacuum. When you purge, it's to entrain the moisture and carry it out and also to decontaminate the atmosphere that your vacuum gauge is measuring in. That's the only good two reasons to do a AAA vac. It is a necessity, and a lot of times when you when your vacuum stalls, you purge it with a little nitrogen, and it'll flatten things right out again, and then you'll verify and make 100% sure that your gauge is reading accurately, and you're, you're at the uh, correct point to isolate and, and check your decay. There are some manufacturers, like specifically some ductless manufacturers, who say this is the process. You go down to 10,000 microns, and then you break with nitrogen, and then you go down to 2,000 microns, and then you break with nitrogen. And in general, what I say is there's nothing wrong with breaking with nitrogen, sweeping with nitrogen, but in a lot of cases, that's not really necessary. The vacuum is more important. Well, and don't forget, too, our industry as a whole is repeating bad practices. You got to remember, these guys that are engineers, service reps, CSR, customer service reps, whatever they are, they're really no different than you and I are. They're high-end service technicians. They're just, some of them have better training than, than others. Some of them are engineers. Some of them aren't. They're just people, right? So somebody told them, this is how you got to do it. This is how you get a proper evacuation. And they saw on their vacuum gauge that it made an improvement when they did this triple evacuation, but they didn't really understand what they were seeing or why they're prescribing it. You know, they've been prescribing it and, it and it may or may not be necessary. For the most part, some of the things people, when they talk about what the effect of nitrogen is a vacuum, what they're telling you is not 100% correct. Does it help? Yeah, for the reasons I told you it helps, but but not for other reasons people may, may come up with. But the really cool thing is degassing happens very, very fast. When you add nitrogen back to a system, it's going to come out almost as fast as it went in. Dehydration is a process that takes a huge amount of time. So once you have a, a piping that's bonded with moisture or you have oil that's got moisture contamination in it, that's what takes all the time to evacuate out. It's not the nitrogen. So when we purge or we break the nitro break the vacuum with nitrogen, it's gonna it's gonna zip out of there so fast you'll never even know you put it in there. Don't fret if it's uh, if it's you know 450 and you got to break the vacuum because by 455 all that nitrogen's back out and you're back down to where you were when you started. All right, so let's think about a practical way of doing this because there are going to be cases where you want to break the vacuum with nitrogen. So that you are going to want to do that from time to time, especially if you want to confirm if you have any leaks or, you know. So let's say you pulled on a vacuum and now you want to break with nitrogen. What's the best way to do that? I mean, how do you how do you go about doing that? Because now you have your two vacuum hoses connected to the core tools. So what do you suggest? Yeah, I, I connect to the liquid side. Now, a couple of think, key things here because you covered them, but I don't think you put enough emphasis on that. We did an earlier podcast about static pressure and flow. You have to have pressure to have flow, but just because you have pressure doesn't mean something is flowing. And that is the reason that you actually need a, a true flow gauge. A flow gauge is simply got a small ball in there, and there's a jet of gas coming up underneath that ball. And as long as the as long as there's gas flowing, the jet of, of gas lifts the ball up and you can see that that it's actually flowing. You can see the liters per second that are flowing to the to the calibrated gauge. If you're to put your finger over the end of that, then the little ball would drop down and it would build up pressure, but there'd be no flow, right? 
And uh, f the flow gauge actually shows us that the nitrogen is actually moving through the system. So if for some reason you have blockage or restriction or whatever, the flow is going to stop and, and uh, visually we'll see that we have an issue. So that cannot be, you don't want to use just a nitrogen regulator to flow nitrogen because um, you, you may not be flowing anything at all. Uh, and so the second thing is, if you flow from the liquid side through, that's the, typically the way that, that I would do it. Anything that's in the liquid line, you're just going to push into the dryer and you want to have that dryer installed right before the metering device. The metering device should be, you know, at that point, uh, fully open and um, it's just going to purge through and come back out the suction line. And so all this is, again, what we use the core tools for, because we can isolate the two core tools, disconnect. One way you can do it is disconnect your vacuum hose if you want to do it that way. Disconnect your vacuum hose. You can do it through the side port of the core tool. Not my preferred way of doing it, simply because every anytime you're connecting and disconnecting through the uh, side port of a core tool, you can introduce some air in there as you're making the connection, you know, if you've got it in a vacuum. My preferred thing to do is to get my flow meter set, my, my nitrogen kicking out, you know, a little bit through my, through my purge valve. Because I got the hose disconnected, as I hook it up to my core tool, it's going to blow the nitrogen in there and pushing the atmosphere out of the way, connect it onto the end of my core tool. I'll see my flow gauge drop to zero, open up my core tool up. I'll see my vacuum gauge start to immediately rise towards atmospheric pressure. And if I have my flow gauge set at one or two PSI, as soon as the flow gauge drops down again, then I know I got my system pressurized. It's up to one or two PSI of pressure. Now I can open up my, you know, open up my liquid side, and, and what's going to purge out of there is nitrogen. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to introduce any atmosphere into your system. The nitrogen, for all intents and purposes, is dry, very, very dry compared to the atmosphere. So we don't want a chance opening that system up under a vacuum and pulling any moisture into the system that we're going to have to spend time removing. So if you do it the way I'm telling you, hook up to the liquid line, let it flow in there until the, uh, you know, set your, your flow valve for one or two PSI or what, one or two liters per second. Uh, is that, would it be milliliters? I'm thinking what it, how those are calibrated. It's um, might be milliliters per second of uh, a flow on there, but it's just, uh, it'll equate to a couple pounds of, you know, a pound of pressure or so. Cause you don't need to, you don't want to take that pressure way high cause you'll drop any moisture out as a liquid. So all we're doing is just pressurizing it. Let the ball fall back down to zero, open it up. It'll start to flow again. And then we got the system purged with nitrogen. Just do a quick sweep of about, you know, 10 to 15 seconds, close everything back up, disconnect my nitrogen, reconnect my vacuum pump, slowly open up the vacuum pump because you're going to have a, a pound or two of pressure on there. So you got to slowly open that up so you don't blow the oil out and take an oil bath and let the pump run to get it back down into the vacuum you need it at. Okay, got it. And there are some like there are some nitrogen regulators like the Western Industries regulator that has the purge and then it has the um, braze function right on the manifold itself. And then Diversitec makes an inline version that doesn't have the little ball. So there are some products out there that don't have the floating ball type of option. You can buy that little metered flow valve. If you go to any welding shop, any gas shop, they, they, they'll sell you the, the little attachment where you can put the ball in there and you can physically see the ball rising and dropping as you have flow. If you don't have one, I'd go out and buy one. They're, they're very inexpensive. A lot of the, a lot of the parts houses, uh, carrier CE, you can probably get them down there. They carry that kind of stuff. United Refrigeration, you know, any, Johnstone. I, I imagine a lot of places will have them. But a wel welding shop might be the easiest place to get it. All right. So I don't really know how you're going to respond to this. So I'm going for the dramatic ending, maybe some swearing, maybe some smashing of your computer, I don't know. But using only one large diameter hose and connecting it to the suction line and then connecting your vacuum gauge to just the liquid line. So your vacuum gauge is on the liquid line with its little coupler and then on the suction line you have one large hose going just straight to the pump, like a half inch diameter hose. What say Jim Bergman about that? Can be done, but not the best way to do it, to, to do things. Uh, a couple of couple of reasons why. All right. Number one is uh, some TXVs are hard shut off TXVs, meaning that without pressure in the system, there's no flow through the TXV and you'll only be pulling from one side of the system. And guys will say, ah, but I can tell that because I have my, my gauge connected to the liquid line. And if I don't pull all the way through, 
then I then I won't uh, I won't register vacuum. And hey, they are one hundred percent correct. The downside of it is it, it comes down to conductance speed. Think about the the diameter of the opening of the metering device, how small it is. You guys have probably all seen a fixed orifice. We're trying to pull all the molecules of gas through that pencil lead sized hole in a fixed orifice or in a TXV through the guts of the TXV and through the metering device of a TXV. It pulling from both sides will always give you better, faster results than pulling from one side will. If I had a choice between pulling through manifold gauges and pulling from one side with a big hose, you might get me to sway a little bit that direction, but um, that's about the only time. You always want to pull from both sides of the system. I actually called a good friend of mine, uh, Andy Shea. He was uh, he works for uh, Tecumseh, uh, and uh, he was a Sporlin rep for years and years and years. Asked him about it when I saw some of the guys doing it, what his thoughts were on it, and, and he he same thing I said pull from both sides. And I respect Andy almost more than anybody in the industry when it comes to best practices. We both had the same opinion on that. So you can do it, but it's less than ideal when it comes to speed of evacuation and proper dehydration. Not the end of the world. It's just not the way I would do it. I'd do it with two hoses. Pony up, spend an extra hundred bucks, get an extra hose. It's worth the money. All right, fair enough. But let's say you show up to a job and you absolutely cannot find your second core remover tool. You just can't find it. And so what do you do? What do you do in that circumstance? How do I connect? Oh, I mean, it's exactly the way you said. I'll pull through the pull through the suction line, have the vacuum gauge on the liquid line, hope that I don't have a, a TXV with minimum operating pressure and and hope for the best and let it run until I see the, see the vacuum gauge get down to 250 microns. I mean, that's... It's, it's going to pull down quickly. It's not going to be as fast as two hoses, but as long as the TXV is wide open, which most of them are, we'll see it come down and we'll be fine. It's more of a time factor. The longer we leave the system in a deep vacuum, the more dehydrated it's going to get. Not the longer we evacuate. People get that screwed up. Some people say, oh, well, if I leave it on quarter inch hoses, I'm evacuating for an hour. Well, yeah, at high levels, you're not dehydrating the system till you get down to 250 microns or, or below, you know, really, really dehydrating it. If I'm pulling it down and getting it down to 250 microns in, in a minute and a half, and I'm holding it down below there for 10 minutes, and then, you know, I'm introducing, uh, doing my decay test 10 minutes later, you know, I have a total of 10 minutes of evacuation versus you pulling the thing down and taking an hour to get down to 250 microns, letting it sit there for another 10 minutes below 250, well, we're both achieving the same goal. It's the amount of time we're holding the deep vacuum that matters, not the amount of time that we evacuate because the deep vacuum is what does the dehydration. Again, it's not ideal, but it works better than quarter inch hoses do for sure. I, it's not something that I would I would recommend, uh, but if I was on a desert island and uh, just had one, one trader core tool, then I would do it the way that they're suggesting. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever bash a guy because he does that way. I'd be glad to see he's in a bigger hose than it would be to see he's just vacuuming out one side, as long as you understand that if you've got a TXV that's a hard shutoff, that you can't, you can't do that. Or a liquid line solenoid or some, something where you'd have to pull from both sides of the system, right? Where you're absolutely required to pull from both sides of the system. One other thing that I forgot to mention is the gas ballast on a vacuum pump. What does the gas ballast do? When do you open it? When do you close it? How does that work? So the, the gas ballast was, back in the day, uh, vacuum pumps and vacuum pump oils, it, it, assembly practices were poor. They're still poor today, by the way. But assembly practices were poor. We had a lot of moisture to deal with in systems. The gas ballast was a tool to help remove moisture from the oil and from the system as we we're doing the evacuation. So the on the on the discharge stroke, the the gas ballast introduces a small amount of air into the oil that's drier than the uh, air that's coming out of the system, and it helps to dry the oil out as the pump runs. Now, the gas ballast is only effective down to about let's say about two thousand microns is where you shut the gas ballast down. Typically, what you would do is you you start the system up with a gas ballast open, start the pump, the vacuum pump with a gas ballast open. You let it run till it hits 2,000 microns, and then you close the gas ballast up. Now, if you're using oversized hoses on a small system, you're not going to have that gas ballast open, but for you know the first 30 seconds or so, and then you're going to close that thing up. 
because it's going to pull down really fast. But on larger systems, you know, we're doing a, let's say a 70 ton system or a hundred ton centrifugal or a thousand ton unit. You have that gas ballast open for maybe several hours while it's getting down to, you know, 2000 microns. The whole idea is injecting a small amount of air into the oil to help de- to help de- dry the oil out, drive the moisture out of the oil so that uh, we don't have to change the oil as often in the pump. The key thing is, though, is that you cannot achieve the ultimate vacuum level of the pump until the gas ballast is closed because you're injecting a small amount of air into the pump all the time, and that's going to keep the pump from hitting its ultimate vacuum level. So you you can obviously, uh, if you put a vacuum gauge directly in the pump and you run it with the gas ballast open, you'll see it'll hit maybe 200 microns maximum. You close that gas ballast up, it'll pull down to, let's say, 10 microns because uh, now the pump's going to achieve its ultimate efficiency. Basically, the pump can't operate as a two-stage pump unless the gas ballast is closed. All right. Well, I think we've uh, I think we've done it. I think we sufficiently beat this dead horse. All right. And uh, we'll do another podcast about it next week, probably, because you never can talk too much about evacuation. Is there anything that you think we missed in this conversation about evacuation? Uh, yes. The only other thing I want to add is if anybody tells you you don't need a vacuum gauge to evacuate a system, don't argue with them. Just do what's right. Go get a vacuum gauge, hook it up. It's, it's just not worth the argument. You're going to run across guys all the time that do not use best practices or even correct practices in this industry. There's guys that'll tell you that they can tell how deep the vacuum is by the sound of the pump and, and uh, they can tell you this or that. And it's the things that we're telling you to do, the the practices we're telling you to use are there for a reason. We're talking about system longevity. We're talking about uh, eliminating unneeded service calls. Ulysses will show you Pitcher after pitcher after pitcher that he's cut apart compressors and they're copper plated. And why are they copper plated? Moisture in the system because moisture, refrigerant, and oil make acid. And that acid strips the copper off the pipes and deposits it on the bearings of the compressor. And then you get seized compressors and burned compressors, compressor failures. And it may not happen for for years. You may it may take 10 years for that system to fail. Well, why would you want a system to fail in 10 years that could last? 20 years. This is not just best practice. It's the best advice you're going to get because doing it the right way, there's just no substitute for it. Trying to measure microns on your compound gauge is like trying to measure feet with your car odometer. It it cannot be done. Okay. If I told you to measure 10 feet with your car odometer, you can't do it. It's not high enough resolution or accuracy. When you're trying to measure 29 inches of a vacuum, on your compound gauge or 29.92, the the difference, I don't have a micron chart in front of me, but you can't tell whether you're at, let's say 10,000 microns or 20,000 microns or at 10 microns. The gauge just doesn't have the resolution to tell you that. So you're going to find people that are going to tell you that what we're saying is BS and it's overkill. But believe me, after all the years of doing this, There's three things that I think are the most critical things to be successful in this industry, and that is properly evacuating the system, properly setting the airflow, and properly setting the refrigerant charge. And those, believe it or not, those are the only three things that we can do in this industry when it comes to adjusting an air conditioner. Airflow and charge are the only two things we can adjust. The evacuation you do right because uh, the only thing you want circulating in a refrigerant system is refrigerant and oil right? That's it. If we add anything else to that system, it's a contaminant. So that's that's all I, I got to say about that in the famous words of Forrest Gump. If you weren't going to say it, I was. All right. All right. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Brian. Talk to you later. Yeah, this is the HVAC School Podcast. That's what you've been listening to this whole time, just in case you didn't know. And uh, a couple things I want to mention to you. One of them is the pipe wiper. I've been talking a little bit about the pipe wiper. It's a really cool product for removing refrigerant oil, residual refrigerant oil, and acid from refrigerant lines. And I talked to Jim Bergman about it. You'll be glad to know that Jim Bergman approves of the pipe wiper. We didn't talk about it in this podcast, but I talked about it separately. You can find that on a-jacksmanufacturing.com. 
And if you use the offer code get schooled, you can get a really good deal on that product. At least just take a look at it. There's some pretty cool videos uh, on the site about that. And it's a, it's just an interesting, innovative product. And I like it better than a lot of the solvents that are on the on the market. Not a big fan of flushing with solvents just because of some of the things that can result from that. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I suggest that you do that on the podcast app. If you have a iPhone or if you have an Android phone, go into the uh, app store the Google Play Store and download the Stitcher app and you can subscribe to HVAC School there. All you have to do is just search HVAC and you'll find us. You'll find us right there. Thank you to all of you who have been here since the very beginning. I want to give a, a big shout out to Ulysses Palacios, to Daniel Anderson, Jeremy Smith, Stephen Rarden, Zach Ciotta, a, a lot of the guys who are out there you know, doing the work and they have been listening to the podcast and giving me a lot of really good feedback. There's so many of you. Chris Stevens is another one who comes to mind. There's so many of you. If I'm missing you, please forgive me. I'll, I'll catch you in the future. But, but those of you who are continuing to contribute, Brad Hicks, that's another one. Brad Hicks, check out HVAC in SC, HVAC in South Carolina. That's his page. It's a really good page. Um, Andrew Greaves is another great guy. There's, there's so many great people out there who have contributed to HVAC School, and I want to thank all of you for everything that you do. Uh, you mean the world to me. That sounds kind of weird. Uh, let me take that back. You mean a lot to me, dudes, brothers. Good job, brother. Anyway, I appreciate y'all. So hiring is a real challenge for anybody. And uh, the other day, I was so desperate that I... I um, I made a job offer to somebody who I normally wouldn't make a job offer to. He was invisible. He said that he thought about it, but he just couldn't see himself doing it. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to quit doing this. All right, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on HVAC School.